Um, the, uh, the goal of my talk is just to give you uh, an overview of what we are doing at the University of Sherbrooke in robotics. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you ideas of different projects and what we've done in the past and what we are uh, planning to do in the future. Uh, and I'm going to be presenting with my son, Simon. Uh, he's going to present part of his, uh, his master's in the, the presentation, so don't don't uh, stress if you see me, Len, uh, ask him all up. It's uh, because he's going to be presenting this part. So let's start by where Sherbrooke. Uh, Sherbrooke is a small town, the university town. Uh, it's about 30 minutes uh, uh, north of the US border, an hour and a half from southeast of Montreal. It's a, it's a very nice city. Uh, the university has 32,000 students, 8,000 staff. 415 programs, all of the programs uh, are, are available. It's ranked first in the world since two weeks ago in sustainable development, so that's very nice. Uh, in the top 15 research universities uh, in Canada, uh, the highest progression in the last 10 years, and um, the uh, if we look more closely at the Faculty of Engineering, we are uh, at the Faculty of Engineering, uh, it's about 3,200 students, 500 staff members. It experienced over the last five years, 225% growth of research revenues. Um, it's the top university for industry university partnership. Uh, and we recently uh, inaugurated a large fab lab facilities uh, in which you saw that you see the, the windows up there. It provides a great view of all the surroundings. So it's, I guess, uh, probably the best view in Sherbrooke uh, for the area. We're also uh, hosting the first and only undergrad uh, research, uh, undergrad program in robotic engineering in Canada. Uh, it's a problem-based and project-based learning approach, so we don't give lectures in that program. We've been doing that at the university for uh, 20, 22 years uh, in electrical and computer engineering, and we uh, adopted the same approach uh, for robotics. We have special classes in that program. It's uh, Some of them are interdisciplinary and entrepreneurship. Uh, and the reason why I've put that there is, is because Simon's work is following that path. Uh, so there's a course called Creation of Innovation, Innovative Product, and it's, uh, it's a class that is being taught with mechanical engineering students, robotic, robotic engineering students, and business students. And the idea is to come up with a, an idea that can lead to a potential product on the market. After that, there's a three, uh, three courses that are called major design projects. Uh, it's 12 credits over three semesters. Uh, they work in teams of six to eight, and it combines electrical, computer, mechanical, and robotic engineering students into these te teams. So we, we come up with very large design project. They, they get to experience management of large, larger teams, and they get to, ex to uh, work with clients or have to, to manage their own project uh, on their own. And it's also supported by activities like entrepreneurship uh, startup pitch for funding. And we also have an accelerator called Asset uh, on campus. In terms of research, the, um, our facility is part of the uh, Interdisciplinary Institute for Technological Innovation, 3IT, uh, in which we have uh, an experimental studio. Uh, that's, I, I like pictures where, where it's messy because there's things going on in that lab. Uh, so we can do experiments with robots. Um, we have a, a place to do uh, mechanical computer engineering and robotics, robotics integration. We have a, a fab lab there, and also we're capable of uh, uh, printing our own circuit boards and do the electronics. Uh, so it's a great place to design complete robotic system. I saw that you guys in U the UK have a, uh, a first initiative uh, called uh, First Tech Challenge, I think. Uh, but FIRST is very big in the US and in North America. You know FIRST? FIRST is an initiative for mentoring uh, uh, primary school and high school kids uh, and get them familiarized with uh, 
STEM, basically mathematics, science, and, and things like that. So the, uh, this was, uh, was launched in Manchester uh, in 1989, and it's, it grew very large, and so now it's, an, it's international. And it's a great way to get students uh, to understand what science can be used for and what mathematics can be used for. So robotic is kind of a pretext for them to get involved. And it's, it's a lot of fun. So it's a very, um, it's a large competition, very, uh, a great place to learn basically. And so in Quebec, the University of Sherbrooke launches, uh, helped launch the, the, the initiative. And now we have Robotic First Quebec, and it's hosting events for more than 8,000 uh, high school students and, and primary school students every year. And so uh, we have that a group of uh, students uh, that wants to come in and do the robotic engineering program. In terms of research, we also have um, a strategic network called ANTARA for Engineering Interactive Technologies for Rehabilitation Network. So we, um, we uh, this network makes it possible for engineering researchers to work in close collaboration with clinical researchers. Uh, for rehabilitation technologies. And the, the last element of the, uh, the puzzle is CARAM. CARAM is a collaborative research and training program on collaborative robotics for manufacturing, working with industry, uh, bringing collaborative robotics into uh, industrial application. So that's give, that gives you an overview of the robotic ecosystem at the University of Sherbrooke. So now let's focus on Introlab. Introlab is the um, intelligent interactive interdisciplinary and integrated robotic lab that i'm directing and it's a lab that uh, i started when I, I i became a professor at the university of sherbrooke 25 years ago and the mission is to bring robots into the real world by designing and integrating mechatronics computer engineering and artificial intelligence and by deploying these technologies in real life settings so the the words in greens are very important because we want these machines to be used in the field, I'm, I, I've been visiting uh, Lincoln since uh, Monday, and I've heard that also here quite a bit. So we kind of connect. We have the same same goal basically. So we uh, we are involved in assistive robotics, which can be therapeutic rehabilitation, socially assisted robots, the presence robot, and also applying AI into robotics could be uh, for field robotics, surveillance, and cognition. We've been, we're going to be covering these. Uh, elements uh, throughout the presentation. So let's start with design and integration. Um, we designed a, a whole bunch of uh, cool robots over the years, uh, starting from small ones to much bigger ones uh, that can be uh, can interact in real life uh, with people. So just to um, I, I won't go into the details for since uh, 1999 that the robots that we designed, but this is. Uh, the spherical robot called Roball. It was designed uh, for interacting with children and toddlers. Uh, so it's pretty intuitive. The robot was able to move around, talk, and do different types of motion pattern. And it's actually uh, became a, uh, there was a research, uh, research project with uh, children with autism that started because of the ability of this robot to get them engaged and get them to focus and interested into the robot uh, to get their attention. And uh, from that, we, we, we made a couple of iteration of, of this robot. So the other one is an, an example of senior design capstone project it was made by 18 undergrad students in EEC and mechanical engineering. They wanted uh, to make a, a, a cool robot. Uh, we thought that having a leg track wheel robot with omnidirectional uh, steerable uh, legs would be a cool thing to do, but that's actually one of our first big integration challenge in robotics in, in terms of design that uh, led us to continue our work uh, in one specific area, uh, which which is basically trying to design actuators that can be compliant. Uh, though, so what you're going to see here is the second version, the second base of the azimuth platform with elastic actuators and the the, the video on the right uh, is uh, Earl. Earl has is, is on the, the azimuth base, but also has uh, arms with el differential elastic actuators. 
Differential, differential elastic actuators is kind of similar to serial elastic actuators. There's a spring between uh, for serial between the motor and the, the uh, effector. But with differential, the spring is between the chassis and the motor, so it makes the, 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 the actuator more compact. And the idea was to be able to interact physically with the robot safely by controlling the torque, and but also by sensing the torque that the, the, the effector is uh, experiencing to make it safe, basically. So you can actually push the robot around and the, the robot is going to sense the, mo the, the, the forces and say, okay, I'm going to go into, into that direction to make a robot that can be just moved around by uh, being uh, moved physically. Or if we put the same actuators in the arms, you can actually position the arm just by uh, moving, moving them around and the robot's going to follow without even know, knowing what we are doing with the robot. So it's basically the first proof of concept and, and uh, use of uh, serial uh, differential elastic actuators. The, the problem with, with either serial or differential elastic actuators is that there's the spring element makes it make the, the, the actuator vibrate when you have fast acceleration or fast deceleration. So we started to work uh, on magnetoreological actuators. So magnetoreological actuators are actuators that the compliant element, it's not an, a, a spring, it's a fluid that changes viscosity based on a magnetic field. So this is one example with only one actuator uh, that um, is programmed, for instance, here to move at a certain speed, but you can actually uh, stop it without, you know, uh, getting hurt or damaging the actuator. Uh, the using, uh, this is an example with, it turns with minimal torque and did, 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 there's a, uh, uh, a pointy thing uh, at the end of uh, the effector, and it actually doesn't uh, uh, burst the balloon. And then we increase the speed, the, the torque, uh, to eventually get the balloon burst, but to burst. So we started with this type of actuator. Uh, we designed uh, actuators that can do two degrees of, uh, of freedom. Uh, everything is uh, controlled uh, using software. So we can say this emulate a low spring um, with the, the actuator. We can emulate uh, medium stiffness, uh, hard stiffness, stiffness. This is an aptic interface. The red uh, square is going to be the position of the, uh, the actuator. And uh, we're going to emulate uh, springs at, the, at both ends. At the middle, no, uh, no friction. So by, pro by controlling that in software, and by having this fluid that can change very rapidly uh, the density based on the magnetic uh, field, can actually create a very interesting haptic interface for actuators. And so we continue to work on that and uh, trying to make uh, arms. This is a, a supernumerary uh, arm, a third arm, uh, using the um, the, the technology, the magnetoreological uh, fluid actuators. Uh, let me see. It's completely back grabbable. And in that demo, someone is controlling the robot with a smaller arm, but uh, the operator can interact physically with it without being hurt or uh, can be uh, can assist the person. So it's kind of funny because they, they did that uh, just to show that the uh, the technology can be used for uh, harvesting tomato <laughs> tomatoes harvesting, uh, but they are actually the group that uh, is doing that now actually are using are building two robotic magnetoreological uh, actuator arms that are going to be used for tomato harvesting. So by being able to be uh, to be able to capable of high strength but also very soft uh, capabilities abilities. So these are examples of you can actually interact with the environment without uh, damaging it uh, if uh, required. Manipulating tools. I'm going to skip this. But also if if it needs to be tough, it can be. So uh, so Catherine is frustrated, so she wants the robot to. So it, 
we can it's capable of uh, uh, very soft and uh, precise motion, but also can be very strong. Uh, and uh, so that's uh, something that uh, we've been developing for the last 20 years. So, so let's talk about uh, move a bit from uh, actuators to perception. And I think a couple of people here talked to me about our time map. So you you know that our time map uh, is a slam algorithm. Uh, it's real time appearance based mapping. We've been developing our time map since I think 2008. Um, the idea is that you're you're building a map using um, visual uh, images of the environment. Eventually, you go you come back to an environment to a place where you've been, and you're looking at the database of images, trying to find similar pattern. And when you find a pattern, uh, uh, similar images, you close the loop. That's the basic idea. But as the number of images grow in the database, it takes more and more time to look to roll to all the all the images. So we need to find a way to uh, compromise, and that's basically what real time uh, our time map is doing. So it's going to be keeping only the most pertinent or more visible, more seen nodes uh, in the working memory. It's going to put the, uh, the visual images from uh, the the other nodes in the long term memory. And uh, when they need, they are needed, they're going to be brought back in the working memory. Otherwise, to try to keep the real time constraint uh, satisfied. So that's just an explanation of this principle. When you're creating a graph of places where you're taking images of where you've been, eventually you're going to find a match uh, with the, uh, the nodes that are in blue that are in the working memory. And eventually, if you're experiencing or seeing something else it's going to create a new path and uh, other nodes are going to be pl placed in the long-term memory so to keep the number of nodes in the working memory um, fixed to a certain number so our time map uh, is a live an open source library and the link uh, is at the bottom the um, it was built to actually be able to compare different slam algorithm uh, so and this is the, 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 the representation of the interaction between the different modules. We added a planner there so that uh, it can be another source of indicating which nodes to keep in the working memory. So when you're planning a path and you, you want to see where that you're following that path, you're going to have to send from the long term memory the, the, the nodes that are a part of this, uh, this path. So that's another incentive or a, a heuristic that is being used by our, our time map to determine which nodes to keep uh, in the uh, working memory. But uh, we're going to show a demo of uh, what our time map has been used for uh, later on. Another thing that we got interested in in terms of perception is robot addition. Um, the uh, when you're talking to you to uh, Siri on your phone or whatever, uh, it's close, it's short distance, it's near field. But when you're interacting with a robot, it's a far field uh, environment where um, you want to do voice speak, uh, speech, speaker recognition, or things like that. The idea is then when you're far field, uh, then you can have other sources of sound that interferes with what you want to hear. Uh, so it can be a reflection also. Well, the idea is how can we make it so that the robot can focus on the interesting sound sources. So. Using microphone arrays, uh, on this slide, uh, it's not clearly visible, but it's in this uh, middle part of the robot. The idea is the robot interacting in real life settings uh, is going to be hearing all kinds of people or sound. And the system must first localize the sound sources around the robot. So that's the, the, the middle uh, graph with the colors. Uh, and then what we call separation is that to be able to isolate using these localization of sounds, isolate the sound so that you can extract, filter out the noise uh, that is not associated with that sound based on location and do things like speech recognition, uh, speaker identification, motion recognition or sound recognition. So basically we came up with two libraries in that case. The more recent one is ADAS. Again, there, there's a link at the bottom. So with ADAS, you basically uh, can 
localize and separate uh, sound sources. And we also made available in open hardware two USB uh, sound cards uh, so that you can have these to connect, you know, eight or 16 microphones in different configuration as you like uh, and use ODAS. Uh, we can also use ODAS with, uh, with um, other, uh, like the Re speaker or the XMOS uh, X-Core microphone array. So this is going to be a short video. You don't hear much of the sound, right? But it's just music. Uh, so you have an interface where you can see where the sounds are coming from, the noises. Uh, you can actually have, uh, with that, one, two, three, so four, five, with the six, noise seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, that's the three, result with the filter four, audio. Uh, five, knowing six, seven, the, the eight, of the sound nine, and ten. The noise out of Cedric's uh, voice. I like so, uh, uh, the uh, 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 for the uh, 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 cafeteria type uh, environment where most people are talking. The ODAS software and try and track user interface for the ODAS system. I build the web interface. The system is available online as open source on GitHub, so you can use it with your own project. Things, an example of project that we did with with Audas uh, and many years. Uh, this is the the Audas many years part. We had the voice activity detection, and when it's triggered, we activate speech recognition and emotion recognition. And then we sent the information uh, to an interpretation module to manage uh, and basically manage the dialogue with with a some sort of a chatbot uh, application. So um, this is something that uh, we wanted the robot to be able to interact naturally vocally with people. But when you're doing, if I compare it with Slam, Slam, you know, you get images and you can get you can understand what went on as the robot moved around. With speech, you know, it happens. You can record it, but it, it's gone, you know. So we came up with a cartoon-like interface so that when we're doing um, vocal interaction with people, we, we take pictures uh, throughout the, uh, the interaction and we put in uh, cartoon bubbles what the robot said and what the, the person said and what is being identified. So in that case, we could recognize if it's a male or a female. If there's emotion, express, and we use icons and colors uh, to express the uh, emotional state. Uh, I'm angry, or I'm happy, or um, I have. Uh, I don't remember the third one. So that's one cool way of representing what uh, what we could get out of, and actually come back and understand what went on during that interaction. Moving forward, we wanted to be able to use RTAM map and ADAS um, on telepresence robot the, uh, for remote care. Basically, we have robots that are being deployed in uh, senior care residences. We wanted to have uh, RTAM map be able to use to be used by the robot so that you know people that don't know the residents uh, can say, I want to go to the kitchen or the bedroom or room of this person. The robot could actually go uh, on it on its own, and the same thing with Adas. Uh, since we in residence is uh, in residences, uh, senior care residences, there's the cafeteria and there's area where there's there's a lot of people and sounds coming from the back of the robot doesn't make any sense, and uh, we wanted to be able to filter that out. So good to give a bit more situation awareness for the uh, teleoperator. Uh, to uh, to better operate the robot, but for that we needed a system that allows us to do video conferencing uh, and also send data for controlling the robot and data coming from the robot. So we had to come to to uh, to implement a the equivalent of a team or Skype for robots. 
But it, this is again made available open source. It's called OpenTerra. Uh, it is developed with clinicians because it's telehealth based. Um, that's the uh, that's one uh, application area that we are uh, using it for. Uh, so uh, it can be used to it to control uh, robots. It's hosted on secure server locally. Uh, it can be connected to uh, biometric sensors. Uh, the idea is to have this uh, centralized framework where we can uh, have clinicians have access to servers and data, uh, can connect to uh, different sessions with, with participants in their home or in the clinic, uh, can have multiple participants, and we control or we can customize it as we want. Uh, having, you know, functionality like this be added to Teams or Skype or things like that would be extremely difficult. So this is an example of a multi-user uh, session, and it's being used by rehab, by rehab. Physiotherapists basically can have gadgets like take a picture and then take the measurement of the range of motion the person is having, do some sort of exercise. You start a, 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 chrono, a timer and you do exercise for 30 seconds. So we can add things that is being actually used when a physiotherapist go to a home and do exercises where with, with patients. It's, it's also being used for doing projects like monitoring uh, the use of elevator tables uh, by, uh, by people. And so we, we use OpenTerra as the middleware to uh, take data out uh, for the system. It's, it can be connected with uh, uh, Apple Watches or wearable device where we store data during the day and send it at the end of the day uh, through a, uh, a database which can be analyzed by another system called OpenIMU to have multiple people um, data that is being synchronized. This is the example of the teleoperated robot that we are uh, using uh, with OpenTerra. So it's, it's basically a beam robot. You may, have, you may have known this robot was commercialized a couple of years ago. Now it's discontinued, but OpenTerra allows us to interface different sensors. Uh, so uh, for vital sign monitoring, it could be the uh, oximeter, could be uh, a weight scale. It can be other types of sensors. So the uh, this is made available uh, open source, it's being used in clinics to do tele-rehabilitation uh, uh, sessions. Uh, it's made very simple for the users uh, to, uh, to access. Then the, the last part of the uh, design integration is the, uh, the reasoning uh, robot control architecture, HBBA. We've, everything that we're doing in robotics at the lab is based on that framework. This is the, uh, the robot control architecture where we integrate, whether it's a behavior-based uh, producing module, perception module, a reasoning module. Uh, we integrate using the HBBA framework because it allows us to reuse behaviors and modules and uh, decision modules or processes across different robots. Um, this is an example of the, the robot that you saw, the telepresence robot. This is an implementation in which we use, uh, again, uh, modules that were used on past robots and developed over the last 25 years. So uh, Ross made it quite uh, easier uh, to do that because we now have a, a shared framework for implementing it. But at, at the higher level, what the, how they interact with each other, that's managed by HBDO. Again, available open source. So then let's now focus on integration deployment. I've chose five cases um, in which the technologies uh, designed the lab are, are used in the field, combining robotics, AI, and uh, deep learning. So Simon. Yeah. So, so yeah, for me, I started in 2019 as an intern uh, uh, in a company and we were working on an autonomous robot and I, I saw this use case where there, there, there were some workers on massage tables having to remove weeds, weeds in fields of carrots. So normally they use herbicides and stuff, but in organic farm they can, and there are not really solutions to remove the weeds otherwise than being, being on the ground removing them. 
So I, I found that curious as to why is this still happening in 29 in 2019 back then, and we decided to start with a the sequence of projects that we had in our undergraduate studies and start the, the project that we call Desherbex. It's kind of like meaning uh, weeding, but weeding X, like in French. But yeah, it's this robotic, robotic machine carried by the tractor that has independent robotic tools that can go right and left and up and down to remove weeds. Uh, on those robotic tools, there are some grippers and scraping tools that can just either pluck a weed or push it into the ground. And uh, this machine was made to be modular and configurable. And as you can see, it kind of looks like the massage tables uh, that were shown before, like except on, except than having people on the massage tables, they are robots. So we're starting a company with this project, trying to, to make it go into the real world. But my master's thesis, is my, my master's is on that project, mostly on the control part. So this is kind of how it works on the control side. I, I won't go into details about that, but basically it's there's a AI that detects the weeds and the vegetables, but mostly it detects only the vegetable. It detects every plant and then it classifies what is the vegetable we're looking at and everything else is a weed. And then with visual surveying and how the, the system works, with the tractors advanced, we're able to target the weed and attack it at the right moment. So this is an example of a picture that our our how our AI works. Uh, you can see here that the carrots are being detected near what it's supposed to do, and they are actually it's actually able to detect the weeds quite well. There's this one like in the middle of the carrots that uh, I looked at the picture and thought that it was wrong, but it's actually a weed. It just kind of blurred through the carrots. But yeah, we're able to have uh, good performances on the. The, the detection side uh, with the control side, we're still working on it, but it's going really, really well and we are trying to, to get it to, to a higher levels in the next few years. So yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. So that's one application I thought would be interested, interesting for, for uh, your uh, amazing agricultural robotics uh, program. Um, home assessment by OT. Uh, basically, this is to give you an example of uh, side effect projects with our time map. We were we had in our team of telepresence robot uh, OTs that were present, and when we show uh, how the robot was navigating and showing our time map and creating 3D maps as the robot moved along. Uh, the idea of using it for home assessment came came about. Uh, and uh, us, I didn't know about home assessment. OTs are going in homes, and measuring, you know, everything to uh, get uh, to get things installed for helping people after coming back from surgery. Uh, so the poles and uh, trying to uh, determine which assistive technology they need. So they they the uh, it takes a long time. They do these manual measurement and sketches. And it goes to another person, a uh, whole bunch of uh, therapists that has to uh, take into account these measurements. So the idea was simply to use uh, a cell phone, uh, to use our time map on a cell phone with the RGBD camera. Uh, now, nowadays, it's easy. You know, all the iPhone 13 uh, iPad can be uh, used for that. At that time, it was an Asus uh, cell phone. But they just want swap the uh, or paint virtually the environment using uh, using the the cell phone. So we made an application that allows them to to do that without any training, basically, um, so that a, a 3D model can be elaborated. This is the not optimized version. Uh, just taking the measurement, then you apply our tab map, and then you get you get the uh, synchronized and more uh, a cleaner version on which we can do measurements automatically or the, the, the user just drag and drop uh, where they want measurements to be taken. It's about 1.5 centimeter of precision, but it's sufficient for them to do their work uh, without taking the measurements automatically. So. This is the example of autonomy, automatic measurement based on uh, 
what what's been uh, seen in the environment, but they can do it manually also. Another another side project side effect project uh, is for surveillance surveillance with the microphone arrays. Um, the um, prisons have a lot of difficulty tracking down drones intrusion. There's a lot of delivery done in prison using drones and uh, radar RF systems are expensive. Uh, they get uh, false response because of birds. Um, so we thought that using microphone arrays and the uh, and ADAS, we could actually uh, use more. If you use only one microphone array, you're going to get the direction of the uh, the sound source, which could be a drone. The drone is making a lot of sound. If you use more than one, you can triangulate the sound, the, 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 these vectors, and get the 3D position quite precisely and direct a, a, a camera toward the, uh, the position of the drone. So uh, at the 3IT, on the same floor that we, uh, we're, we're at, there's a drone expert so to, uh, to make a demonstration. Just a proof of concept, basically. Microphone array that we put on, on tripod and uh, simply, you know, simple setup and the fan tilt boom camera uh, nearby and uh, at the control station. Determine which area we want to monitor because because you know the directions uh, and the positions uh, in triangulation, you can actually say, I'm tracking this area, I'm not tracking this other area. Striking multiple drones, two drones in that case, and switching back and forth using the fan field camera. So the technology was developed for human robot interaction, but it's actually being commercialized now and for prison surveillance systems. And we combine these receptors with video processing uh, info. So uh, so it's it's kind of, in terms of deployment, was yeah. un, not planned okay, plan at all, uh, but it's what happened. Hey, Dub, can you do something for me? That's the latest oh, robot that we're developing. Uh, it's a robot companion well. called Tita. It integrates a microphone array, also, an RGB camera, a uh, touchscreen interface on a steward can platform. It has a Jetson uh, onboard computer running yes, uh, all the processes uh, the and the behavior and the perception module with Celsius neural networks, like neural networks for recognition Celsius. of different elements. Humidity is 25% and wind speed is five kilometers per hour. Obviously, it's a computer, so it's connected to the network, so we can- uh, Can you sing me a song? Provide request to the robot's gonna ask, I it's gonna get that. information out of the data, uh, the, the network. Can you tell me a story? You can interact vocally with it, so yes, it integrates course. a the equivalent of a chatbot. There once was a little robot named T Cop who lived in Robot City. You can change the interface as you want. Uh, it could be this face, could be another face, so could be no face at all. But you control everything. So that's the idea. And it's actually uh, using also open data to be used and deployed in the in senior care residences. Same. Can you play a song and dance? And obviously we wanted to make a simple demo. Yes, of course. It's not a very good dancer, I have to say, but uh, doesn't have a lot of large set of moves, but still, uh, the main purpose for all of this is for us to be able to take robots and to let lead these robots out in the field. Open Terra allows us to do the monitoring and the maintenance if required. It, it's all made to be uh, robust, real time, and uh, reconfigurable as we need for whatever needs uh, comes up by interacting with these uh, different populations. So the um, we are 
are we are doing field trials in senior care residences, getting reactions from different seniors. Uh, not only reactions, you know, the first time they see the robot, but having to doc, being able to document repetitive use of interacting with the same person with the robot and getting the robot to uh, to become, you know, a familiar technology for them rather than just, you know, deploying, having being excited or not being excited at all by the robot and then, you know, not coming back after all uh, after that. The idea is that the robot is there, they continuously are, uh, are capable of interacting with it and it allows to move past the familiarization stage and get them to understand this can be useful for me or this can't be useful for me. And for us to under, understand what would be a good thing for them to have as a, a robotic companion. And we're also uh, focusing on trying to use the robot and the interaction with people to get the robot to understand more about the world by interacting with seniors and asking them different things about what the robot is capable of seeing. Because as I was saying, this is the HBB architecture uh, of uh, TTOP. There's five neural networks that can, four neural networks that can do <clears throat> things like object detection, pose estimation, face alignment, face recognition, do sound, uh, sound recognition, voice embedding, <clears throat> sorry, and classify audio sounds. So these, this, all of this information comes to the robot and we try to have the robot understand how to make use of this information through the interaction with seniors. The next thing that we are working on is robot living labs. So we're gonna be, uh, we're trying to uh, set up five robotic research uh, facility where robots are going to be operating 24-7, uh, one in clinical setting and one in residential setting. And we're going to have robots and different types of sensors uh, on which we're going to be able to uh, have the people uh, interact in different ways. Uh, and OpenTerra is going to be the main uh, framework to integrate everything. So that's the direction that we're moving uh, into. To sum up, the, uh, the reason why I call my talk human robot symbiosis is because the, um, the general objective is to have all of this uh, work towards some kind of human robot connection, you know, developing system, robot system that can collaborate in, with humans in open and uh, messy conditions of the real world. Um, the um, projects where I've described uh, are based, our attempts in that direction, we adopt a holistic approach, uh, enabling robots to seamlessly see, hear, and be in everyday settings, and design robots that are situationally balanced, basically uh, in which the complexity levels of sensor, motor, uh, and artificial intelligence uh, or cognitive capabilities are matched with the environment and people. And that's in a similar way to AI, where there's narrow AI to solve one given problem, and general AI, which intelligence, a distinct property for task specific ability. We're trying to do the same thing with HRI, moving from a narrow perspective, focusing on specific uh, interaction modalities to uh, general, which consider robots, people and living uh, in living spaces as a whole as a whole. So this is summarizes the attempts that we've been moving toward uh, over the 25 years and in the next uh, uh, decade or decades to come at, uh, at Eindhoven. I want to finish my talk by providing some invitations. So uh, if you see uh, any research or academic collaborations, uh, please uh, contact me. Uh, we're, we're very much open for that. Uh, if uh, you're interested of doing uh, speeches or be invited virtually or in person uh, for uh, summer, for, for, for uh, lunch conferences or summer school or Congress through an entire or, uh, Karam, uh, please also contact me. We're looking for speakers. If you are looking for faculty position, we are hiring. So <laughs> and you want to learn French, come to the University of Sherbrooke. Um, I'm also uh, the uh, editor in chief of the current robotic uh, reports. Uh, so we're looking for section editors in service and attraction robotics, orthopedic and exoskeleton, defense and military, and construction, infrastructure, and resource uh, robotics. So 
if these are the things that interest you, please. Um, I'm here until Monday, so uh, not and even afterwards, uh, contact me. And this is the uh, website for uh, for the land. So that's all for me. Thank you. Any questions? If any. Yes. So I was curious. Forgive me. I'm going to probably say it wrong, but for the meteorologic. Uh, Let's say MR. Um, I was just curious. Does the 